Hello, I am Ernesto Priego. Uh, I'm very glad to be here, even if it's remotely. Uh, this is the title, the title of my presentation on oligopolies of knowledge, digital humanities as a term, and open access. My perspective is from the global south. I'm Mexican, and I made uh, you know most of my academic career just before the um, second masters that I took and a PhD. Uh, in the UK, but uh, my formation, my background is is, is completely uh, from the global south, from from Mexico, and even though I've been working in and studying in the UK for the last 15 years, I still think that my perspective, even though now centered and widened by the global north, comes from the global south. Um, oligopolis of knowledge is a term that uh, uh, Domenico and I uh, have been discussing. We made a couple of presentations last year in which we discussed the dominance of a few for-profit publishers in scholarly communications uh, because I will be talking about Scopus, the database that's owned by Elsevier and the Relics Group. I'm um, focusing here on Elsevier that as uh, an academic scientific publisher has had an annual revenue of about 24 5.2 billion US dollars with a higher percentage of profit than Apple. That gives us some context. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to take into account as part of the context that hybrid publishing has become one of the standard uh, business models of academic publishers uh, uh, in, the, in the global north, in which uh, journals offer the paywalling option at no cost to authors, and an open access offer is uh, available uh, through article processing charges or article processing fees that uh, normally assume that they, uh, you know, a funder will pay for the author, an institution will pay for the author, but often in the arts and humanities it ends up being the author who has to source the funds if they are interested in paying open access. The result is that not many do. So Scopus, as you know, is a large, well it is as advertised, the largest abstract and citation database of peer-reviewed literature. Uh, it is owned by the Relics Group and it is often used to metricate uh, uh, scholar the outputs, uh, author age index, uh, university rankings, promotion criteria is uh, almost un still widely, uh, if not universally, used, uh, you know, to de decide the fate of academics and institutions. Uh, so this proprietary database has a lot of influence and a lot of power. Uh, we argue that Scopus not only costs money, even though, you know, due to the, the non-disclosure agreements and uh, traditional opacity of uh, this company, which is, by the way, based in the Netherlands, uh, but also globally, uh, it is not known how much a inst specific institution would pay for, for, uh, for, the, for the database. But uh, as a subscription uh, service, only those with access to it can can access it. But more importantly, only a few, uh, well, only those uh, publishers that do do uh, uh, publish in particular ways get indexed by 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 Scopus. So 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 those that don't uh, get get excluded from the from the database. Uh, this is for indication. Uh, it's highlighted Oxford University Press how in 2014, which was the latest date that Lawson et al. Uh, obtained uh, information about uh, uh, how much UK institutions were paying to specific publishers to Oxford University Press in 2014. Uh, uh, we paid almost 3,000 so almost three million pounds to Oxford University Press, almost 40 million pounds to Elsevier. So that's for subscription journals. They, these subscription journals are often hybrid, which means they offer the open access option through APCs, article processing charges. Uh, in 2015, uh, the average APC from, uh, from these uh, main scientific publishers, the average APC was 1,700. Uh, 162 pounds that 
an author would be expected to find funding for or pay themselves. And this is, we argue, one of the reasons why many authors do not choose the open access option. Uh, we've been looking at, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, how much content there is uh, indexed in Scopus in, you know, in areas relevant to the to 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 the to the digital humanities. So looking at computer science and artist and arts and humanities subject fields, uh, this has been the volume in both in both fields uh, with an increase of 21% in the last five complete years of computer science outputs, but a reduction or a decline of 16.5% of articles. Uh, we still need to uh, recognize that the scholarly monograph has more importance perhaps in, in arts and humanities than the journal article, but the journal article remains the way in which, at least in the UK, uh, uh, the age index is measured and the way our, uh, authors are assessed by exercises such as the Research Excellence Framework. Uh, so looking at the main author affiliations, countries of affiliation in computer science, uh, the, those countries in grey are, are, are countries that have very few or none at all uh, you know, no authors from those countries appear as, as as main authors in the data obtained, or a very very limited number as main authors. And this is in, for comparison for computer science. Again, we see a dominance of the of the United States and most countries in the global South uh, still, you know, with a with a minimal uh, or no uh, main author. Uh, uh, affiliation visible. There is a citation dominance as well. You know that there is a slight correlation uh, between the 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 number of the number of articles and the number of citations. With the exceptions, for example, with India, in which we see that even though India has the third largest number of articles published, the citation count is rather low compared to China and the United States. So what is happening there? Why are people not citing uh, uh, scholarship by, by Indian authors or authors with Indian institution affiliations? Uh, we see a dominance of the United States and the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Canada, uh, Spain, Italy are present in these uh, top countries, but the difference between the United States output and the output of uh, other non-English speaking countries is massive. Uh, so this is correlated with the dominance of the English language in this period. This is the period, by the way, that the currently the Research Excellence Framework is, is considering. Uh, so, so 92% of published articles in computer science were in English, uh, with English language growing 22% and Chinese language decreasing. And since China is such an important uh, producer of computer science research, we can argue that the, the, it's possible that Chinese authors are now publishing more and more in English and less in Chinese. And uh, for arts and humanities, we have a whopping 79% of published articles uh, in English, uh, but we have 28 more languages than computer science in arts and humanities, so that is good, but they still uh, represent a minority. Uh, we have a dominance of the closed paywalled model, with only 19% of computer science articles being open access and only 12% of arts and humanities articles being open access. Uh, and uh, we see that the, you know, fields uh, the, the, we have fewer articles in, in 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 arts and humanities, and that may be explained by the uh, centrality of the of the monograph in our, in arts and humanities. So, looking at Scopus for you know digital humanities as a term in the title keywords and or abstract of publications in the last eight years and a half, uh, show that you know in, in 2018 there were almost 400. Uh, uh, documents. Of course that there may be digital humanities outputs out there indexed that do not mention the phrase, the two, the two terms together, digital humanities in title keywords and or abstract that we may consider digital humanities scholarship, but uh, you know we're only looking for those that have these terms. If we look at the top 10 authors, we see names that we recognize. 
uh, that may indicate how some authors uh, you know have a lot of outputs as main authors whereas uh, you know leaving other authors you know way behind and this is correlated with a sheer dominance of a few countries and uh, organizations uh, institutions it is really interesting how in the last eight years and a half King's College London you know has uh, you know uh, uh, a notable majority of her authors, followed by the University of Amsterdam, Trinity College Dublin, and and UCL. There are no institutions from the global south here. Again, we are only looking at the affiliations of the main or principal corresponding authors. Uh, Eighty-eight percent of those documents are closed, so that is not good at all. A minority of articles are available open access. Uh, looking at, uh, on the other hand, you know, we may, you know, we do some granularity here and only look at Journal of Digital Scholarship in the Humanities articles. I was interested in looking at those that have been tracked by Altmetric, i.e., that they have been measured as or tracked as as having mentions in social media, the news, uh, policy documents, uh, etc. Um, so non-traditionally scholarly venues. Uh, we noticed that uh, a majority of those that were most mentioned uh, were uh, that a majority of those that are tracked at all were paywalls. However, those that had a metric score over ten were open access, indicating that those that are more most discussed were open access in comparison to those that didn't have as many mentions uh, were really paywalled. The processing fee, because the Journal of Digital Scholarship in the Humanities is hybrid, so it offers the open access option, and uh, you know depending on the license. Well, here the, the price is the same for if you want the CC BY attribution or non-commercial license. Uh, the, the the price seems to be the same, so, um, uh, plus the plus taxes, and some countries get a discount and some countries get a waiver but uh, we need to look into which author you know if there are any any fee waivers that have been given and uh, if any con authors from these developing countries have been taking advantage of this uh, of this discount or and or waiver uh, the self-archiving policy indicates that uh, once we published in the Journal of Digital Scholarship in the Humanities, if we are lucky to do so, uh, the preprint, i.e. pre-peer review, can be uh, self-archived, but not in a commercial repository or commercial service. It has to be an institution repository or your own blog. Um, and the authors can archive the post-print. That is a, usually a Word document or LaTeX document, but uh, the version of record or the publisher's version, that's the stuff that most people will want to cite and show off and uh, use in their CVs, etc., and therefore cite, uh, cannot be archived unless it is open access. So we have this challenge because people do want to publish uh, where everybody else is publishing, they want to uh, appease and keep their employers happy, they want to contribute to their universities, uh, place in rankings, go for a better place in the rankings, etc. So uh, everyone seems to be trapped in this publish or perish, uh, integrate or die competition. And it seems like uh, open access is not gaining enough traction because it has also been basically, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's been trapped or it's been exploited by commercial publishers uh, as another business model in which the author needs to pay to publish and when authors don't have that funding and when authors have never been used to having to pay to to, to publish anywhere uh, it is very hard to see how that option will become attractive uh, to, 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 to underprivileged scholars. So, but it's also very easy just to put the blame on these for-profit commercial companies, and I think that we, as a, as a sector, as academics, we should also be asking ourselves, you know, what we need to do differently to avoid perpetuating the same, uh, you know, aggressively competitive, uh, exclusionary culture of scholarly publishing as defined by these commercial uh, information 
and data companies like, like Relix. Uh, so we must know that there are limitations, obviously, to this. We must acknowledge there are limitations to what I've been saying. We would need a more systematic approach to the data collection, uh, have the same uh, periods that we are capturing. Uh, we must recognize that Scopus does not capture everything. It does not mean that that's all that is in terms of digital humanities, but we are interested in looking at exactly what's not there, what's being excluded, and the overdominance of some institutions, in some cases even of some individuals, in some cases of, uh, in many cases, in, you know, of some affiliations of some institutions, uh, uh, and of the English language. Uh, this, this reflects a, an epistemological paradigm that is more significant in its exclusionary power than the financial factor. So I believe that it's not necessarily APCs for open access that would be deterring the progress or the visibility of authors and publications produced from uh, Global South uh, institutions and therefore with Global South perspective sometimes but it's really the assessment paradigm and the, the publish or perish culture that is uh, taking us into this uh, the terrible exclusion of difference and uh, creating an homogeneity of scholarship that is not really producing different kinds of work or the inclusion of, of different epistemological paradigms. So what do we need to do different? I think we need to do that work. We need to provide solutions. It's a shame that often it is the excluded or the victims that, need, that are asked to provide the solutions. Uh, so sometimes it should be enough for those that feel excluded to point it out and then for the commons for the community to come up together with practical solutions. Why are we stuck with such traditional proprietary and exclusionary methods of dissemination and assessment? Thank you very much. I hope this does not take so long. Um, I have shared the slides online. Uh, they include the references. Thank you very much. I hope there can be time for questions.